Well, we're going to come to this uh, time in our service now where we'll look at uh, a passage of Scripture from the Bible. We're going to just talk about what it means. Uh, Why was this written? Uh, What is it supposed to mean to us today? We believe this is not just some ancient book that was written thousands of years ago, that this is a living book, that the Holy Spirit actually inspired men to write these words so that the words wouldn't just be a historical document. They'd be living words that speak to us as well today. So if you have a Bible with you, if you would turn to John chapter 8, the Gospel of John chapter 8, beginning at verse 31. If you're using a Brown Pew Bible in front of you, it's on page 758. John chapter 8, beginning at verse 31. And when you found that, if you would stand together with me if you're able and we'll read together. John chapter 8, beginning at verse 31. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So If the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know you are Abraham's descendants, yet you are ready to kill me because you have no room for my word. I'm telling you what I have seen in the Father's presence, and you do what you have heard from your father. Abraham is our father, they answered. If you were Abraham's children, said Jesus, then you would do the things that Abraham did. As it is, you're determined to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. Abraham did not do such things. You are doing the things your own father does. We are not illegitimate children, they protested. The only father we have is God himself. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I came from God and now I'm here. I have not come on my own, but he sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? Because you are unable to hear what I say, you belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desire. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Yet because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Can any of you prove me guilty of sin? I'm telling the truth. Why don't you believe me? He who belongs to God hears what God says. The reason you do not hear is that you do not belong to God. The Jews answered him, Aren't we right in saying that you are a Samaritan and demon-possessed? I'm not possessed by a demon, said Jesus, but I honor my Father and you dishonor me. I'm not seeking glory for myself, but there is one who seeks it and he is my judge. I tell you the truth, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. At this the Jews exclaimed, Now we know that you are demon-possessed. Abraham died, and so did the prophets. Yet you say, if anyone keeps your word, he will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham? He died, and so did the prophets. Who do you think you are? Jesus replied, If I glorify myself, my glory means nothing. My father, whom you claim as your God, is the one who glorifies me. Though you do not know him, I know him. If I said I did not, I would be a liar like you, but I do know him and keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. (laughs) You are not yet 50 years old, the Jews said to him, and you've seen Abraham. I tell you the truth, Jesus answered. Before Abraham was born, I am. At this, they picked up stones to stone him, but Jesus hid himself, slipping away from the temple grounds. This is God's word. You may be seated. Let me pray for us just once more and just commit what we're going to look at here to God and ask him to speak to us now. Living God, we come to you now and to look at your word and ask that you would speak to us through it. We believe this is a living word and that you have brought each person here this morning today because you have something specifically you want to say to us. And God, I pray that you give us open hearts, open ears to hear what it is you want to say to us, what it is you want to teach us and reveal to us. 
May we be those who are open and receptive to your word. You say that when you send out your word, it doesn't return to your void. It accomplishes the purpose for which you sent it. Oh God, accomplish that purpose in us today. As I always ask now, eternal God, would you move and govern my tongue to speak your truth? Amen. Well, it was last year, uh, April 21st, that Queen Elizabeth II, now the longest reigning monarch in British history, celebrated her 90th birthday. She was uh, born in 1926 to King George VI and Queen Elizabeth I. In 1947, she was married to Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh, and then in 1952, she assumed the throne after her father died of lung cancer. Uh, her coronation service the following year at Westminster Abbey. She has four children. Uh, she loves corgi dogs. And her middle name is Alexandra. Now, just because I, I know all that information about the queen, would it be accurate for me to tell you or, or anybody else that I know Queen Elizabeth personally? Could I uh, call her up later today, I mean, giving allowance for the time difference, and, and recite that stuff back to her, and she would recognize me as someone that knows her, and we would have a good chat together? Invite me to stop by for high tea the next time I'm in London. Probably not, right? No. Uh, uh, because just because I know facts about Queen Elizabeth doesn't mean I know her personally. It means I have an internet connection and I've seen the crown. Uh, that's, that's all it means. But maybe Queen Elizabeth is an a extreme example, but just think about it. Is there, is there anywhere in life that we believe that we know someone personally simply because we know facts about them? I mean, you wouldn't sit down next to somebody you'd never spoken to before on the bus and say, listen, I, I've read your Facebook and LinkedIn profiles, and I know you very well, and we're best friends. What should we do today? You don't do that. Now, now, if you want to know someone, okay, yeah, you, you creep on all their social media, you, you uh, talk to people that know them, uh, ask them about what they're like, but in the end, if you want to develop a personal relationship with someone, you want to know them personally, you, you talk to them. You ask them questions, you, you listen to what it is they want to say about themselves and tell you about themselves. That's, that's how you know someone, really. And then even beyond that, to develop a really deep personal relationship, you don't just need to know that person, but you need to engage your affections with what you know about them. That's how we develop uh, those really deep personal friendships. When we, we don't just know someone, but we, we like what we know. We love what we know about them. We're beginning this uh, new series this morning called I Am. Looking at eight things that Jesus told us about himself in the Gospel of John. Uh, things that he wanted us to know about who he is. And if you want to know uh, the heart behind this series, the why of this series, right, from, right out of the gate, this is it. That all of us would not simply know about Jesus, but that we would get to know and love who Jesus is. You know those are different things. Not just knowing about Jesus, but knowing who he is and loving who he is. And if you're new to Christianity or you're just kind of checking this whole deal out, maybe you say, oh, that's great. Yeah, I've got a lot of questions, so I'm glad you're doing this. But, okay, I get it. We're, we're at a church. Probably a lot of Christian people here. You might be thinking, seriously, that, that's what we're going to do? Uh, you know you're talking to mostly a Christian audience. Uh, I'm pretty sure we covered that chapter uh, some while ago. If that's, if that's what you're thinking, I would just say to you, first of all, hey, even in our everyday relationships, don't we, we, don't we have a lifetime of learning to do with people we already have a personal relationship with in order to maintain that relationship and continue to grow deeper? Okay, so how much more should that be true with Jesus? But beyond that, I want to submit to you this morning that even for somebody who's, who's been coming to church all their life, 
There can also be a very real tendency in some people to to say, we know Jesus. When really, you only know Jesus like I know the Queen of England. You, you, You know a lot of facts about Jesus. You could tell me a lot of true things about what he did when he came to earth, but you don't yet know him personally. In fact, if you are feeling like maybe you've plateaued in your faith, or that Christianity doesn't actually really make that much difference to your life at all, I wonder if that couldn't be one of the big reasons behind that. That you don't yet have that personal connection, that heart-transforming connection with Jesus that you know and love. At this point in time, right now, you just know a lot about him. Well, wherever you're starting from this morning, the great news is that This same Jesus who knows you perfectly wants you to know him as well. He wants that. He desires to have that personal relationship. He's not playing some kind of cosmic game of of clue or the the, the things are all hidden in the little envelope. He, He actually wants to reveal himself to you and have that deep personal relationship with you for you to know him that way. And in Philippians chapter 3, verse 7, the Apostle Paul tells us there that that, that, that pursuit, that, that this pursuit of knowing Jesus, there, there is no higher pursuit in life. There is nothing greater, no, nothing of greater benefit in anything that we could ever pursue in this world than that, to know Jesus more and more and more. And I bet you there's a number of people in here who, who would agree with that 100% because we too have, have experienced the, the great and deep benefits of knowing this Jesus and knowing him more each day. So, as we set out on this getting to know you adventure uh, with Jesus, the very first thing, as we sit down for that first coffee date, whatever, very first thing Jesus wants us to know about himself is that he's God. He's God, which if you are, that's, well, that's something you should probably let somebody know pretty early on in the relationship. It's going to have a lot of implications to your, your friendship from that point on. So thank you. Thank you, Jesus, for, for telling us that. But again, remember, we're not just collecting more facts about Jesus. We don't just want to add, okay, Jesus is God to the pile of stuff we know. We want to know, well, why? Why does, why does he want us to know that? Because if we know why he wants us to know that, that's going to help us to grow, to know him and love him more deeply. And I believe the purpose of Jesus' revelation of himself as God to us, very simply, is this. It's to bring about a heart response. It's to bring about a heart response in us. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, if Jesus really is God, that's a really important piece of information to know. Okay, great. But once you know that, once that's put out on the table, you've got to respond to that in some way, right? I mean, that's too big a deal to just leave it there and be like, oh, you're God. Well, isn't that interesting? No, you're going to respond somehow to that. You're either going to Say, okay, if Jesus is God, I need to worship him as God. Or you're going to just ignore him as as just a loon, or you're going to reject him as a liar and a deceiver. Those are really only the options you have if somebody comes to you and says, by the way, I'm God. Those are really only the the main options you have. Which, of course, is why uh, I think we're going to see in our passage, as well as In a lot of other places, we've seen this in life, a lot of people want to avoid the question of Jesus' deity altogether. They don't want to talk about that, and I think the reason is because to face the implications, they don't want to face the implications of answering that question. And at the end of the day, it's just simply too costly to to the the kingdom that they've set up, it's too costly to answer that question, so they just avoid it. Because if you think about it, Jesus is mostly safe. He's safe for the whole family, really. I mean, as long as he's a teacher, as long as he's a wise sage with chicken soup for your soul, he's, that's, that Jesus is fine. Because that Jesus, I can pick and choose the things I want to accept and the things I want to reject. Jesus is like a buffet table. 
But if Jesus is God, if he really is God, well, then now a respect, admiration, well, those are no longer, that's no longer enough. If he's God, I have to reckon with everything that he said and taught now. The point is this, Jesus will not allow us, people in our passage, he won't allow us today, he won't allow us to leave the question unanswered. Once we know and he's revealed to us that he's God, he's not going to let us leave the question unanswered, at least not for long. Which is why uh, it led a well-known author and professor C.S. Lewis to say once this of Jesus, a man who was merely a man and said the sort of things that Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level of a man who says he's a poached egg, or else he'd be the devil of hell. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great moral teacher. He's not left that open to us. He did not intend to. End quote. So, as we look at our passage today, this first of Jesus' I am statements that we're going to be looking at, I want to look at this passage in three ways as we consider our own response to Jesus' revelation of who he is. So we're going to look at the questioner's identity, And then we'll look at the majesty of Jesus' identity and the comfort of Jesus' identity. All right? The questioner's identity and then the majesty and comfort of Jesus' identity. So if you've closed your Bibles, would you open them again to John 8, beginning at verse 31? Let's consider this first thing that Jesus wants us to know about himself. Now, there's quite a lot going on in John 8 here about identity. Uh, But before we look at what Jesus wants to reveal about his, we need to know the identity of these people that he's talking to, these people who are questioning his authority and these claims that he's making. The reason is because Jesus is talking to these people who are pretty certain about what their identity is, and they don't want to tell Jesus all about it. And yet, Jesus is about to blow their minds as he reveals to them that they're quite mistaken, actually, both about their own identity as well as his So let's look, first of all, here at the questioner's identity. The questioner's identity. So who are these people Jesus is talking to? Well, we see in verse 31. Look with me there. John writes, To the Jews who had believed in him, Jesus says this. Now, in the New Testament, whenever we see that term, the Jews, very often it's not referring to Jewish people in general. It's referring to a specific group of people who were devout followers of Judaism. This would have included people like the Pharisees and the religious leaders of the day. But if you look at the verse right above 31, we see that some of these Jews had begun to put their faith in Jesus. They begun to think he might be onto something here. And so that's why John says now in verse 31, some of these devout followers of Jesus were beginning, or of Judaism, were beginning to believe in Jesus. But before they rush out and get their names printed on their new Jesus jerseys, Jesus says this in the second half of verse 31. Look there. If you hold to my teaching, you're really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And it kind of makes them stop and just say, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. You follow your teaching. Wait a minute. So they say in verse 33, we're Abraham's descendants. We're his descendants. We've never been slaves of anyone. Now, what they're referring to, of course, is spiritual slavery because, I mean, one of the big parts of Israel's history was their slavery in Egypt. So they're saying, we've never been enslaved to anything. We're Abraham's children or Abraham's descendants. They make this very same claim again down in verse 39. Look there. Abraham is our father. They're saying, hey, that's our identity. We're Abraham's children. But then look at Jesus' response. In the second half of verse 39, Jesus says, No, 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 if you were Abraham's children, you would do the things Abraham did. But as it is, you're determined to kill me. A man who has told you the truth that I heard from God, Abraham did not do such things. So very simply, Jesus is saying, Yeah, I get get that you're Jewish people. And and Abraham, you, you descend from Abraham, that's great. But 
You have no standing with God. You, you have no freedom from slavery of sin just because of that. You're wrong if you think that having Abraham as your father alone saves you because you don't even act according to faith in God like Abraham did. You don't even do the things he did. Instead, you're trying to kill me, a man sent by God. And when Jesus begins to press them like this and the, the holes in their logic begin to come out, look at the second half of verse 41 here. They, they throw up a smoke screen of insults and, and now they're changing their tune. Now they're saying, okay, no, 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 then God himself, he's our father. But Jesus won't let them take on that identity either. Look at this, uh, verse 42 now. Jesus says, no, no, if God were your father, you would love me. And then before they can come up with another option, uh, Jesus says, look, let me, let me tell you what your identity is. Let me read that in verse 43. Why is my language not clear to you? Because you're unable to hear what I say. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out his desires. Now, wow. Okay, that sounds like a pretty harsh thing to say to some people. I mean, they're just having a discussion about their Jewish heritage, and all of a sudden Jesus is like, no, no, you're all children of Satan. Okay, well, that's, that sounds pretty extreme. You might want to be like, hey, Jesus, just calm down. Uh, it's probably not that extreme. I mean, maybe they do some things wrong. Yeah, and they, they, they want to kill you, but children of Satan, really? But if you look at the flow of Jesus' argument, what he's saying throughout all these descriptions is that children act like their father. Children act like their father. Abraham acted like his father in heaven in, in obedience to God, just like Jesus is acting in obedience to his father. But in seeking to murder Jesus, these Jewish leaders were acting. Now, they weren't acting like Abraham. They weren't acting like God. They were acting like Satan, who was himself a murderer and who also wanted to see Jesus murdered. He's saying, you're, you're just acting like your father. So that's your true identity. When we think about that in our own lives today, how, how, how identity and understanding our own identity is so important, I think there's two things that we could take from that right away. First of all, if you believe that that rule following, a, a religious observance, being a good person is, is all that's required to be a child of God, remember, the, the religious leaders, the most devoutly religious people around in Jesus' day, he just told them they were children of the devil. And the reason was because they were trusting in their rule-keeping ability, their moral uprightness, and their Jewish heritage in order to save them. They were trusting in that instead of God. In fact, they didn't even really think they needed God all that much. I can, I can save myself, thank you very much. So for us, what that means is whatever you think it is, uh, reading your Bible, going to church, giving money to charity, coming from a Christian family, whatever you think it is, those are all good things, but none of those things save you. None of those things make you a child of God. Only faith in Jesus does that. The second thing we can see is that we can all admit none of us obeys God perfectly. We, we don't. You don't, I don't. None of us obeys God perfectly. But if you say that you're God's child, but you aren't seeking to live at all like your father, then what is your true identity? I mean, if you'll forgive the expression, some people have said it this way, I mean, if you say you love Jesus on Sunday, but you live like hell the rest of the week, what, what is your true identity? You may be mistaken if you really believe that you're a child of God. Jesus says there in verse 42, a child of God is someone that loves him, and that is receptive to his word. That's, that's what a child of God is. So this is not about never sinning. We just said you can't do that. But what it is, it's about your attitude towards sin. What is your attitude towards sin? Is it the same attitude of your father? And again, that's not just the obvious sins. That's also especially in the religious leader's case, the sins of self-righteousness, sins of believing that we don't actually need God to save us. We can just save ourselves. Those are the same sins that define who we are. Okay, so that's who Jesus is talking to, and that's important for us to think about when we think about what is our own identity. But let's come now quickly to look at who Jesus reveals himself to be in that context. 
So we'll look first of all at the majesty of Jesus' identity. The majesty of Jesus' identity. Have you ever been in a situation where you come home from work, you come home from school, and you can smell dinner cooking? You smell something, and it's just like, oh, yeah. But if you have kids, you know that that same experience can immediately be a very polarizing thing, depending on the opinion of each person about what's being cooked. If you love what's being cooked and you smell it, you're asking the question, hey, what's for dinner? You're asking it in a hopeful way because you're really hoping it's what you think you're smelling. But if you hate what you're smelling, you're saying, hey, what's for dinner? But you're asking it now in like the sort of a dreadful, like, oh, please, oh, it's not what I think it is. Well, I say that because in these last 10 verses, and really uh, in a number of places before that, it's pretty clear the religious leaders can already smell who Jesus is. In fact, if you remember Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus in John chapter 3, they, they, they've got a pretty good idea of who Jesus is, and they're terrified. They're terrified that he might actually be who he looks like he is and who he's claiming to be. And honestly, I, I think that's the reason for all these Smoke screens, all these insults and, and, and diversions, calling Jesus there a, a, a bastard child. We're not illegitimate children, basically like you, Jesus. Uh, 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 saying that, calling him a Samaritan, that would have been one of the most insulting things you could say to a Jew. They hated the Samaritan, so to call him that would be like calling a Jewish person today a, a, a Nazi. It's, it's a, that level of like, what? You do not say that. Or even just the diversion, saying, you know what, you're crazy, Jesus, you're demon-possessed. They're doing anything they can to distract and divert because they've got to deal with Jesus somehow, and they can't just ignore him. He, he's challenging their authority. He's challenging their stability at every turn. So they've got to do something about it. But rather than just allowing themselves to consider that maybe he truly is who he says he is, or worse, the people around them believing that, they, they, they're distracting, they're diverting, oh, look over there, or oh, what about this? They're, they're, they're doing anything but answering the question. And again, I'm saying it's because the implications of the question for them, it's just too costly. They can't afford to recognize Jesus as who he's saying he is. But like I said earlier, Jesus is not going to allow us to avoid the question, then or now. As a pastor and author Tim Keller says of this passage, Jesus is basically saying, look, Crown me or kill me. But you're going to have to put your flag in one of those places. And now in verses 52 to 53, there's a whole discussion now about Jesus' authority and who he's claiming to be, whether or not he's claiming to be greater than Abraham and the, the prophets. But when the religious leaders finally think they got Jesus cornered and they got him at the end of their proverbial sword, all of a sudden they are leveled by the way Jesus responds, because Jesus basically grabs a hold of their sword and walks right into it. Look at verse 56. Jesus says, Your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. Let me explain what's going on here. There's a couple of things. First of all, Abraham, and then particularly all of the prophets were constantly talking about a coming day. Sometimes they would call it the day of the Lord. Now this was the time that God had prophesied when he would come, destroy all of his enemies, and, and restore Israel to their rightful place, to their former glory. But did you notice what Jesus didn't say? He didn't say, Abraham rejoiced to see that day or the day. He said, he rejoiced to see my day which for the religious leaders would have been like the first smash of a battering ram against their wooden gates. And then, not only does Jesus imply that the, day of the, the coming day of the Lord was referring to him, then he says, Abraham saw that, basically saw me, saw my coming, and was glad. Now, there's a number of different interpretations about what, well, what did what did Jesus mean by that? Some people say that Abraham literally was given a vision of Jesus coming. He saw that and was glad. Uh, some people say that's referring to pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus uh, when he met Abraham back in the book of Genesis. Some people think it's more just metaphorical. The book of Hebrews talks about some of these patriarchs looking ahead and, and grasping these truths from a distance. 
and being glad. And Abraham was glad to look ahead and see the fulfillment of these promises God had made to him. But whatever it is, whatever Jesus means by this, this is yet another smash of splintering force against the gates of these religious leaders who are questioning him. And, and, and they don't know what to do with it. They don't know how to respond to this. And so in verse 57, they basically ask Jesus a really a childish, almost schoolyard kind of question. Look at verse 57. They're like, oh, oh, so, oh you're, you're not yet 50 years old, and, and you've seen Abraham. Really, they're mockingly asking him, well, Jesus, you, you, you look great for a 2,000-year-old guy. Honestly, you don't look a day over 50. Really, that's great. What, what do you use on your skin? That's, that's fantastic. They, they, they don't know what to do, so they're just, they're just mocking him. And yet here, in verse 58 of our chapter here, is where the battering ram now shatters their gates to sawdust. When Jesus replies to them, I tell you the truth, before Abraham was born, I am. Now stay with me here, because... <laughs> Maybe you read that and you're like, okay, was, was that it? Did I miss it? Yes, okay, yes, that was it. No, you didn't miss it. Let, let, me, let me explain what we're talking about here. First of all, Jesus doesn't say, before Abraham was born, I was. Basically saying that he was, yes, I really am that old and I was old enough to see Abraham. No, no, no. By using the present tense of the verb to be, I am, Jesus was saying, Actually, I'm a lot older than that. Actually, I have no beginning. I have existed from all eternity past. Which is kind of the first indication of why C.S. Lewis would say that a man who was just a man and said the stuff Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. It would be crazy. But then also, in referring to himself as I am, Jesus is not just suffering from poor grammar skills. He is taking on himself the divine name of God, Yahweh, given to Moses in the wilderness. That's what he's saying about himself. I'm not going to have you turn there, but in Exodus 3, if you know this story, Moses is in the wilderness. You remember Christian Bale or Charlton Heston, whatever. They're walking through the wilderness and there's a burning bush. And God calls him out of the bush and he says, I'm, I'm sending you back. I'm sending you back to Israel to free my people from slavery. And Moses is like, okay, if I'm, if I'm going to do that, they're going to ask me who sent me. So who should I say sent me? What's your name? And God replies, I am who I am. This is what you were saying to the Israelites. I am sent me to you. And then God says, and this is my name forever, the name by which I am to, remember, to be remembered from generation to generation. Now, we spent a whole lot longer covering this uh, last year when we went through those first 15 chapters of the book of Exodus. But just to summarize us, to catch us all up here, most commentators believe when God reveals his name, I am, what he means to Moses is that he's describing himself as the supremely self-existent one. The one who, who, who is not dependent on anything and who is not defined by anything to define his existence. He is just the God who is. And that is who Jesus just claimed to be. Now I know that just took us a little bit to get there. But as you, if you look at verse 59, it didn't take the people Jesus was talking to a second. They knew right away exactly what he was saying, which is why they picked up stones to stone him. Because he was profaning God's holy name. He was blaspheming. He deserved to be stoned. That was the prescribed punishment for blasphemy. And yet this is who Jesus is revealing to them and to us of who he is. So as we're learning about who Jesus is, first of all, we can see Jesus wants us to know that he is God because that's a really important, significant part of our relationship with him, isn't it? If he truly is God, then we need to worship him as God. We need to praise him. We need to offer our lives to him as God. That's, that's, that's why he is telling us that. If, if, if Jesus is the self-existent one, 
uh, the eternal creator of everything who made us and everything we see, that, that has a great bearing on our relationship with him, what that looks like. That's why Jesus' deity is such a big deal, because if he truly is God, then what he says and what he commands, those are not up for debate. Those things are not up for popular vote. If he really is God, his words, we need to be taken seriously, and his commands have to be obeyed. But maybe you'd say, I don't know. Hmm. Maybe you don't agree. Maybe you don't accept that he's God, or, or at least you live like he isn't. But if that's where you're at this morning, uh, I'd want you to at least ask the question of why you don't think he is. Why do you really not believe that he is God? He's saying he is. You, you're, you're going for either the crazy option or the deceiving option. Okay, Why? You don't have to tell me or anyone else, but ask yourself in your own heart, is the reason really because uh, what we see here of the life, the ministry, the, the miracles, the resurrection of Jesus, is that really not sufficient warrant to believe that he's God? Or is there another reason? Is maybe one of the reasons, like the religious leaders, you simply have too deeply a vested interest in Jesus not being God. And maybe it's just too costly to surrender the throne of your life to him. Too much would have to change. I have to change too much of my life if I really believe that. And yet, Jesus is forcing us to put our flag somewhere. He's revealed that he's God. Now we've got to do something with it. And the first thing he's revealed here is he is the great I am, the self-existent one, the God of the universe. Well, Okay, that's, that's the majesty of Jesus' identity. There's at least one other thing we'll cover quickly here. That Jesus wants us to know about himself by revealing he's God, and that is the comfort of Jesus' identity, which is what we'll look at finally, the comfort of Jesus' identity. We need to look at this other aspect of Jesus' identity because think about it. If Jesus is only this transcendent, all-powerful, completely other from us God, then he's impressive. He's worthy of our worship and our awe, but he's also distant and unreachable. It's certainly not somebody that you could ever have a personal relationship with. God, I mean, he doesn't have personal relationships with people, right? If Jesus is only majestic, if he's only this self-existent, all-powerful creator, then Jesus is like a Terminator robot. He, he's he's all-powerful and, 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 and unstoppable, but he's also unfeeling and impenetrable, which is exactly what has led many biblical scholars to suggest that seeing the revelation of God's name in Exodus 3, I am, seeing that solely as a supreme ontological statement is both too narrow as well as too Greek an understanding of God's name. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, it was Greek philosophers like Aristotle, Plato, who first introduced concepts like ontology, the study of existence. They were the first ones to really introduce those concepts into Western thought, but that's the fourth century. That's, that's long before God revealed his name to Moses out in the wilderness. And beyond that, the Hebrew sense of name is very different. It's very relational. It's very contextual in how Hebrews would understand what a name means. So while it's absolutely correct to see God's divine name, I am Yahweh, as a supreme statement of God's self-existence, it is, we also need to ask ourselves and consider what that name meant to a Hebrew in an ancient Near Eastern context. How did Moses understand that name? How did God's people understand that name when he revealed it to them? And we saw a bit of that when we read in Exodus 3 where God was saying that this name was the name by which he was to be remembered for all time. God says, I want you to use this name throughout all generations. Now, that's, some people refer to that as it, it was God's covenant name, his memorial name. It's relational already. We're seeing, I want you to always call me this. We're going to be together for a long time. But even more deeply, when we look a few verses just before God reveals his name. Again, this is still part of the context where God reveals his name to Moses. 
Moses is, is terrified. He's questioning God's call on his life. He's feeling inadequate. He's feeling scared and terrified. And in response to his doubts and fears, in Exodus 3, verse 12, we read this. And God said to Moses, I will be with you. I will be with you. Which has led scholars to see, particularly in, again, this big context in which the divine name is given, along with showing Moses his transcendence and all-powerful godness, the name, the covenant name I am also means the God who is with you and for you. It's both. The God who is high above us and the God who is with us and for us. It means both. And all of a sudden that changes everything, doesn't it? Because now, God is not just this powerful, faraway deity. He's a transcendent God of the universe who's on our side. The the creator of all things who cares about his creation and acts on their behalf. What does that mean for you today, whatever it is you're facing in your life, to know that God is not just ruling over you, he's also with you? And this was actually a consistent theme. God revealed himself consistently throughout the Old Testament this way. When, when he came to Joshua, who, who took over from Moses, he, after Moses died, God says to Joshua, I will be with you as I was with Moses. And then, as it relates now to Jesus taking on this name, there was a prophecy about Jesus coming in Isaiah 7:14. Behold, the virgin will conceive and you will call his name Emmanuel, which means what? God with us. And those were Jesus' final words to his disciples after he had resurrected, before he ascended to heaven. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I believe that this too is what Jesus wants us to know about himself when he takes on that divine name, I am, in John 8 here. He wants us to know he's not just an all-powerful, self-existent deity out there somewhere. Jesus is also the God who is with us and for us. And he demonstrated that most supremely when he left the glories of heaven and came to earth, suffered, took the punishment for our sins on himself on the cross in order to restore that broken relationship between us and God, he demonstrated that I am the God who is with you and for you. And he gave us his spirit. He gave us his spirit that would always dwell within us so that, as David says in Psalm 139, uh, where can I go from you, spirit? You are always with me. I can't get away from you, even if I wanted to. This, too, is what Jesus wanted us to know when he said, before Abraham was born, I am. Okay, wow. There's the first thing Jesus wants us to know about himself. I think that marks a pretty significant point in our relationship, and, and, and it should. Someone telling us they're God, that's, that's a big deal. But to see that Jesus is the transcendent God, supremely above us, means, yes, he's worthy of our our worship and our obedience, and yet he's also the covenant God who is with us and for us. It means he cares about us in all our circumstances, in all of our struggles. As we close here, the last question I'd want us to consider as we've been reading through this passage, you may have asked it yourself, why? Why would Jesus reveal himself this way to these people, these guys who who didn't believe in him really and who wanted to kill him? Why would he reveal himself as God to them? And I think the answer lies simply in remembering the purpose for which God reveals himself, for which Jesus reveals himself as God. The reason why he does that, it's not just to give us information, it's to elicit a heart response. He wants to elicit a response, but just because he elicits a response doesn't mean it will be a positive one. It doesn't have to be a positive one, as we've seen this morning. Uh, This same revelation of Jesus can also bring about a rejecting response, a, a suppressing response. 
Maybe you've experienced that yourself as you've tried to share Jesus with other people. You've experienced that very same response. Or maybe that's your response this morning as you hear Jesus revealing himself as God. Maybe your response is, no, I don't know. I don't, no, I don't think so. In C.S. Lewis's classic children's series, The Chronicles of Narnia, he describes just such a varied response to the revelation of who Jesus is by uh, describing in a story these four children who go into this magical land of Narnia. It's uh, Peter, Susan, Edmund, and Lucy. He describes a situation where they hear about Aslan. Aslan, this great lion who is actually the Christ figure in all the stories. And when Mr. Beaver first tells them about Aslan, this is how he describes their, their different heart responses. He says this, None of the children knew who Aslan was any more than you do. But at the moment Mr. Beaver had spoken these words, everyone felt quite different. At the name of Aslan, each one of the children felt something jump inside of them. Edmund, he felt a sensation of mysterious horror. Peter felt suddenly brave and adventurous. Susan felt as if some delicious smell or something delightful strain of music had just floated past her. And Lucy got the feeling you have when you wake up in the morning and realizing it's the beginning of holidays or the beginning of summer. In the Second Corinthians 2, Paul describes just a phenomenon just like this. When he talks about us who, who are now followers of Jesus, if you are, how when we speak about Jesus, when we reveal who he is to people, that we are like an aroma of Christ, he says. But there are varied responses. To some, it's an aroma of life, and to some, that same aroma is the stench of death. And what we've seen here this morning is, is very simply that, that revelation of who Jesus is being the stench of of death to some who will not or who feel like they cannot receive who Jesus revealed himself to be. It's the stench of death to them. Which means that the revelation of who Jesus is is both a life-giving, it's a saving thing, but it's also a condemning, judging thing. It's both. Because it brings about one of those two responses. But in the end, at least what we see is no matter what, people are given the opportunity to respond. He puts the revelation in front of you, and then you respond. It's plain. It's plain that not all will respond favorably to who Jesus is. Not all will see this revelation as a call to deeper relationship with him. They won't. But as the Apostle Paul says in Romans 9.33, See, I am laying in Zion a stone, a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense. Yet, whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Do you hear those two responses again? That's because our response to who Jesus is, to who he's revealed himself to be, that determines our identity. That's what determines our identity. How do you respond to who Jesus is? Today might be the very first time or one of many revelations to you of who Jesus is. My one call and prayer to you as we close now is to consider what's your response? How do you respond to this revelation of Jesus? I pray you feel it drawing you closer to him, deepening your relationship with him rather than pushing you away. I pray as the author of Hebrews says, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Where will you plant your flag today? Let's pray.